So we're going to continue with elliptic equations. Uh, this is basically the second installment, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, it also in, in, in the third lecture, and then we'll go to the navier stokes equation shortly thereafter and start to sort of put this together. So in this lecture, uh, I'm actually going to talk about two methods. Uh, I'm going to talk about them sort of in inverse order from when they were important. Uh, I'm going to talk second about fast direct methods. Uh, they were actually very important in the development of computational fluid mechanics uh, because they were very effective, they're very fast, uh, but they're fairly specialized also. So, um, sort of mid 90s although uh, early 90s uh, there was the, there was uh, maybe late 80s and early 90s early 90s were really were sort of took up uh, multi-grid methods were introduced and they were a little bit like the ADI method in the sense that there was a there was an idea there that was discovered and promoted and then of course once the idea was there it turned out there were multiple um, embodiments of that idea and this became quite a bit of an industry um, it, those are very effective methods. They're very powerful. Uh, they have been, to some degree, um, sort of taken over by Krylov's methods now, although multigrid methods are still sort of a very important part of the arsenal that uh, we have to solve our elliptic equations. And the multigrid methods are often used in conjunction with Krylov's methods uh, as precondition, pre which I'll talk a little bit about next time. So uh, I'm going to talk about the multigrid methods first, and then just say a few words about fast direct methods because even though um, they're not nearly as sort of central to computational fluid mechanics as they used to be, they're still pretty useful if you have the right type of problem and they certainly played a major role uh, in computational fluid mechanics at the time when they were introduced. Okay, So, uh, the multigrid method really is, is based on a fundamental observation that uh, we have sort of already dealt with, but I'm going to go through that again. So, uh, so again, um, well, I said most of the things that said on this slides, and as I said, when I wrote this multigrid method for among the most popular ones, that was some years ago. And as I say, overall, I would say over the last few years, Krylov methods really have taken uh, taken over. Um, so, the idea behind the multigrid is a very simple one, although it leads to sometimes more complicated codes. And if you understand the idea, you will see that this really has application in a whole host of other areas as well. Indeed, uh, multigrid methods have been used to solve steady state problems, just as they've been solved, used to solve elliptic equation. So I'm going to introduce the idea just by looking at the one-dimensional elliptic equation. Okay? So it's a very simple problem, just the second derivative is equal to a source term. And I'm going to solve this as I was solving a time-dependent problem. So I simply, you know, I had some uh, the FDT there. I put in some some alpha, um, which of course can be anything. And then I take the limit as time goes to infinity. Then uh, the derivative is zero. The time derivative is zero, and you know, alpha could be anything. Okay. So uh, if I solve this equation, it turns out I can actually solve this equation analytically. Okay. So. Uh, if I expand it in Fourier series, and then I assume that G can be expanded, and if I can expand G, you know, basically I've rewritten B. Usually we would write sum of some C times the, uh, times the uh, cosine and sine here. And because I know what the answer is, instead of writing one coefficient here, I've just written this as B times K squared, okay? So I haven't really done anything because, you know, if this was a constant, then B would get to be constant over K squared, okay? I just rewrote it because I know the answer, um, and I put case, uh, case squared there. So if I substitute it now into the uh, original equation, this one here, um, then the derivative, the second derivative space, gives me a case squared, and that's why I wrote this case squared over here. So now this is relatively simple. Okay, these terms here, I basically have separate equations for every component, and that gives me that the uh, uh, evolution of t is equal to this one here. Okay, so uh, I can solve it. And um, I have these results here that uh, basically uh, the amplitude 
um, goes as the case as e to the power of this alpha k squared times t. Okay. Now the important thing. Uh, I set it up in such a way that basically as t goes to infinity, a becomes uh, becomes k. But the important thing is that the error, the difference between the initial guess and the final guess, goes here as this is value uh, here, as I already said. Okay. So the important thing now is that uh, this is the sort of the rate of convergence. So I can find a time scale here, which is one over basically k squared. Now, what does this mean? Okay, so e to the power minus k squared t means that if k is very large, that is if the frequency is very high, so the solution goes like this, that will decay extremely fast. But if the solution, if k is, is, um, k is small, so you know you have k being sort of you know, a long wave, right, then it will take forever or at least a long time to decay. Okay, so high frequency wave numbers die out almost immediately, whereas low frequency wave numbers decay very slowly. Okay? So basically, if I have a wave, if I have an uh, initial error, so this is the difference between the final solution and the initial condition, then I start iterating, then this wave here is going to disappear almost immediately. Now, why do I need a fine grid to resolve this problem? I need a fine grid because I need to resolve this one here. Right? The long way I can resolve by you know, three or four grid points, right? Okay. So we have a little bit of a of a contradiction or a paradox here, in the sense that uh, we okay. Here's supposed to be a movie. I can't remember. I actually failed to check if this movie ah my most profound apologies here. I looked at these slides and I forgot to do this. Uh, I'll run this way for you next time when we you know, do this. But basically what you see in the movie is that this high frequency wave disappears almost immediately, but the long wave, this is actually two waves of equal amplitude, although you partly see the long amplitude wave here, the long amplitude wave takes forever to die out. Okay? So, uh, So basically, as I say, we uh, can do a stability analysis, or we can do you know, some analysis of how fast this goes. And here's the ratio of the initial amplitude uh, to, the, to the, the initial error to the high and low frequency amplitude. And you can see that basically the high frequency um, amplitude here goes much faster. Basically, the difference is this n squared, this is the wave number. And uh, this one will decay uh, way before this one here decays. Okay? So, uh, again, the short wave errors became much faster, and I've said this already, but I'm sort of trying to uh, really iterate on this uh, because this is really central to the idea of a multigrid method, okay? Um, and because my, well, my movie didn't work, but this is actually a few frames from the movie, and you can see that if I start out with an error there again, you know, with, with, uh, <laughs> wave number one and ten, the, the, after just a few time steps, the high frequency is completely gone, but then if I take 100 more time steps, I haven't gotten rid of the long time error. Okay? So, now, so I, I have, I need fine grid to resolve the high frequency wave number. I need but the high frequency wave number, um, my, my time step is set by the fineness of the grid. Okay, so if I go back to the slide before, the um, the delta t is basically uh, set by the um, by the uh, value of h. So if h is very large, uh, very low, then I have to take very small time steps. Okay, so. I have to take small time steps because I have fine grit, and the, I need fine grit to resolve the high frequency component of the error, but that one dies out almost immediately. Okay? So the fundamental idea is that you solve the problem for, or you iterate a few times to get rid of the fine grit error, okay? 
And after you've iterated a few times, the high frequency component of the error is gone, then you use a coarse grid to resolve the long wave uh, component. And then you can take much bigger time steps uh, and um, basically get the same convergent rate as you got for the high frequency. Okay? So you take the problem. The error will contain any kinds of components, all kinds of wave numbers. You iterate a few times. You have gotten rid of the high frequency error. You go to a coarse grid and you solve for the, you iterate a few times to get rid of the frequency there. And then uh, you use that basically, you combine it to get it to a degree. Okay? Now, uh, the uh, fundamental idea is very simple. It turns out that the actual uh, implementation is a little bit more complicated. And I'm going to show you a one dimensional example of how this is actually, uh, actually implemented. The uh, example is taken from a, uh, multi-grid packets that was written at uh, NCAR, National Center for Atmospheric Research, and was distributed by a package called MUDPAC. Um, so here is the example. This is the example that we looked at in the, uh, in the uh, what was supposed to be the movie. So I do you know, the standard things. I approximate this by finite differences. I'm going to solve this by the most elementary iteration technique that I can think of. So I just do a Jacobi iteration here, okay? And the important thing now is that I'm going to write this, this source term here basically as some R, because it turns out that as I, as I change things, everything stays the same except that the definition of R changes a little bit, okay? So this is my iter iteration scheme, just a Jacobi iteration. I can solve it with a gap side or do anything else if I want to, but we're going to make keep things simple. So uh, here is my... Uh, here is my uh, iteration again. So I iterate this uh, until my solution is changing slowly. That means that all the high frequency waves are gone. Then I write the fully converged, I write, I assume that the fully converged solution it can be approximated as this slowly converged solution to this system, this hat, plus some error. Okay? So I didn't iterate all the way to until everything was converged. I just iterated until things were going converging slowly. So this is the solution to this, or the slowly converging solution. And this is the error that I haven't solved. Okay, substitute that back into this one here. And now I have a, um, now I have an expression basically for the unknown, which is delta, and the second derivative of this f hat, which I know. This is what I solved for. This is what I got on the course grid. This is the slowly converging solution. And so now I have an equation. And if you look at, compare this equation with the other one, and you call this stuff here R, you will see you have exactly the same equation. Okay? So here's what I do. I have this F hat on this grid here. And then I transfer everything to a coarser grid. And then I solve for delta F on this one. So on the fine grid, I solve for the correction to the solution that I have on the fine grid. Okay, and uh, if I discretize the equation on the J grid, then basically uh, I can, it looks exactly the same, okay? If I call the whole term here R, okay? this is basically everything that I know, I call that R, and then I can solve it now on the course grid, okay? And then, of course, I can do the same thing again. I solve until it is converging slowly on the J grid. Then I write the solution again as this solution here plus the correction plus the correction to the correction. And then I transfer everything to an even coarser grid and then I do it again. Okay? So I keep going until I really have gone to the finest grid where I assume I can solve everything uh, exactly. So this is on the J grid. Uh, again, I just rename R, uh, and then the equation looks exactly the same as before, okay? And uh, if, I, if I call X the quantity that I found here on this grid, then delta X is the quantity that I have here, and I can generalize it so that I can always go to quarter and quarter grid, okay? So on the first grid, X is F hat on the Next coarser grid, this is delta x, it's delta, delta x, and so on, okay? So this one is the correction 
if I'm of the portion. Okay. So, um, this now allows me to uh, go all the way up to the final grid, where I uh, can actually, usually I show it simply exactly at the coarsest grid, okay? So there is no correction to the solution of the coarsest grid, okay? Now I need to go back, and so I need to correct the solution on the grid below, and I simply, you know, for the points that overlap, I just say xi is now whatever it used to be, call it x hat, plus the correction from the quarter grid. And on the grid where they don't overlap, I have to do something else. And in this particular case, the simplest thing is just to do a bit more interpolation. Okay? And then I keep going. Okay? Now, because you do the, these corrections, typically you don't get exactly the right solution when you're coming back from the course grid. Okay? Because you have done some interpolations and you have done, um, you made some approximations during that step, okay? So, uh, so typically you would iterate again. You know, you would not do this just once. You would do this whole step a few times uh, until everything is converged. Now, as you can imagine, this makes for complicated coding, okay? And that is one of the problems with the multigrid method. It's actually hard to code it. Um, this is the example from Mudpack, and. Uh, you know, it is actually pretty compact. So in that sense, it is sort of reasonably well written in that sense of, you know, they managed to get the whole code into a page. Uh, but it's a terrible code if you try to read through it. You know, it has go-tos and, you know, all kinds of nasty stuff, okay? You know, when I learned programming 100 years ago, it would take a few decades. Uh, you know, go-to was a perfectly reasonable statement. Now, of course, it has been completely banned. You know, you cannot, if you want to do structured programming, you, you shall not write a go-to, okay? But in this particular case, you know, you can, I have actually sat down and gone through this logic. I'm not going to put you through that. But basically, you know, there are all these statements that, uh, you know, let you look back into the code here. Um, now, on the Piner, uh, and then you jump around here, you know, I've forgotten a little bit exactly what the logic here is, you know, basically, uh, basically, this is the whole solver, and this is the gauss side of iteration. So this is really, uh, this is really where you do all the work. Okay? This is where you do the uh, go to the um, finer message. So here is where you take the average, and now uh, it's where you go back up. To. Not where you go back up. To. But as I say, this is the gauss side of iteration. This is the, uh, this is where you go back. To your, uh, this is where you just transfer it directly. This so it's a fairly complex code, okay? All right. Indeed, um, when we first started using mud packs in sort of uh, the early 90s, uh, for multigrid solvers, there was not a parallel version available. So a, a graduate student of mine, Bernard Bunner, actually wrote one of the first parallel multigrid solvers, pretty much I think following mud pack. Um, and I'll show you resources sort of where you find these kinds of things a little bit later on. Um, or in the next lecture, and we can go and look and see if, if his code is still there. Last time when I looked, which was about two years ago, it was still available. So in any case, uh, you know, here is the actual iterations. Uh, this program is easily run. And uh, so you start here on, uh, you know, you start with uh, 64. Yeah, you start with 64, uh, start with 64. Uh, grid points, and in this case, that we have iterated only four times, so you know the solution is converging slowly. Then you coarsen it up again. You stop after four iterations when the convergence is reasonably slow. Now, at the very last uh, grid, when you only have four grid points, then you iterate to convergence. Okay, and sometimes you don't iterate just to convergence. Sometimes you use an exact method and just solve it completely. You can use that bit because you, you have very few grid points. So in this case here, you know now you have grid points, so then you go back, you go back, and you iterate, okay? You transfer the correction, and then you iterate, and you transfer the correction, and iterate, and so on, and so forth, until you come to your final result, okay? So, now, in this particular case, we sort of went, we went, started on the finest grid, we went to the coarser grid, and then we went back up, okay? 
it turns out that there are lots of different strategies to actually do this. Um, and after I've shown you the 2D example, I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, some of these different cycles to do that. So in two dimension, in two dimension, uh, at least in the most elementary implementations of multigrid, you know, it's pretty similar. You just try the 2D stencils, and uh, again, you do the same thing. You integrate here, you write this <coughs> as an iterative solution, then you define the correction, and you go, uh, again, this is the converged solution, which you don't know yet. Uh, this is the end, this is the solution, and you have iterate, what you call the F bar in the earlier one, and then you have the correction. And then you can go through this, uh, you know, and successively correct. I think this example here actually only uses two levels, uh, but I'll show you another one that has sort of uh, multi grades in just a moment. Okay. So uh, again, you know, you do it almost everything ex everything the same, except that the interpolation when you go down to the finer bit now is a little bit more complicated because you have you have uh, three possibilities of uh, where to interpolate from. Okay, so this is here, this is a, just a two-level interpolation. Um, in this particular case, we use a gauss seidler uh, This is just the, the, the steps. Let me go to the, uh, okay, let me just go to the grids here. This is essentially the same as we did for the one-dimensional case. And, and this is just the, there's a slight complication here that I wanted to talk a little bit about this. When you go to the, when you have the coarse grid and you go to the finer grid, there are now several possibilities because obviously when for these points you simply interpolate here, for this one you interpolate there. But for those points here, you typically go to a linear interpolation between all of those. So there are actually sort of different interpolation strategies. Uh, here you vary the i and here you vary the j, uh, whereas, and then in between you have to go take the average of the four points. So there are different, you know, you have to be, this makes for a slightly more complicated code when you have to uh, when you have to move between uh, the different uh, interpolation strategies. Okay, so what I was starting to, to say earlier was that uh, in the simple case we sh I showed you with the one-dimensional case, we just did what's called a B cycle. That is, we started at the finer grid, we iterated until we hit the coarse grid, we solved things exactly there, and then we corrected, iterated, corrected, iterated, and so on and so forth until we were back to the time grid. Now, it has been found that sometimes you can be quite a bit more smarter than this. And here's where the sort of the little bit of arbitrariness comes in. For example, um, often it's possible to, or to uh, accelerate things if you iterate to some intermediate level here, or you correct to some intermediate level, and then you go back and to the coarse grid, and then you go to the fine grid. And of course, now what I have told you, you can do this, you know, you can do this, and you can do that. You know, you can combine it in an arbitrary number of cycles of various complexity, and people have done that, okay? So, um, so it, it's, as I said, it's possible to try to optimize this. And again, you know, lots of, there were lots of papers and, and uh, effort to, <laughs> work this out in a um, in as efficient way as possible. Okay, so um, uh, just to sort of show you another uh, little bit more formal here, here is, I showed you a 2D one. Uh, this just goes to the basically a uh, four level recycle. So you iterate, you know, and it's the, how you go from one grid to another goes by its different names, uh, sometimes called restriction. So basically you go to the grid two, where you have this operator that takes you there. Uh, and again, you do the same thing here, you do the same thing there, and you go to the, on, on the finest grid. And then you have to go back. Uh, this looks a little bit involved, but uh, this is mostly to just sort of show you the uh, notation, because the idea remains pretty simple, and basically the one I showed you on the, uh, on the finest grid. Okay. If this is a B grid, if you didn't get to the sufficiently small residual, then in this particular case, you just repeat the whole thing over again. But there are other strategies where we do recycles and various things, okay? Now, for smooth solutions, 
This works extremely well. Okay, uh, and here's a little test problem that I took from uh, Hannah Anderson and Fletcher. Uh, it's a Laplace equation, which of course is a very simple problem, uh, where they looked at several methods how to solve this. Basically, there was a there was a conventional solver, there was an SOR, there was a multigrid with two levels, and then a multigrid with maximum level. So if you started at 129, you could portion to 65, 32, 70, and Okay. So basically, uh, they, they looked at how the what was the optimum solution time, and as you would expect, you know, it goes pretty, uh, has a pretty dramatic effect, okay? So, uh, basically what this shows is that if you have, obviously, if you go from gauss seidler to, uh, uh, to an SOR with optimum omega, you always drop quite significantly. If you go to multigrid with just two grid, two levels, you actually don't see that much of an improvement, but if you go to the uh, multigrid with maximum number of iterations, uh, portioning, uh, you see two things. A, the total iteration count goes back quite a bit. But more importantly, it turns out that the total number of iteration does not depend very strongly on the size of the problem. Okay? And this is very important because uh, for the standard iterative methods, you know, basically as you make the matrix larger, um, us, we will talk a little bit about next time, uh, the convergence rate goes down. So not only do you have more points to iterate on, but you will have to do more iterations uh, for the matrix to actually solve it. So the multigrid method, multi method has this very nice property that the, sort of the, the work doesn't increase significantly um, when you go to higher, go to more and more levels. Okay? So now where multigrid has problems it tends to be in uh, problems which have very uh, sharp interfaces. So if the solution is smooth, this works absolutely wonderfully. Uh, but if the solution has, for example, discontinued <coughs> coefficients, then because the fundamental idea is you go to coarser and coarser grids. So if you have very small structures that are inherent to the problem, they get sort of washed out as you go to coarser and coarser grids. Okay. So the problem looks different on the finest grid and on the coarser grid. Okay. So uh, we have used this one, you know, for many many years. Um, this is quote by John Adams. Uh, this is called the mud pack multi grid. I can't even remember why he called it mud pack. Uh, mud. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. I don't think it was just that. There was. There was. There were a number of packages. There was the MGD multi grid Delft. That uh, was written by uh, Wesseling that we used quite extensively. There was a code called multi black box multi grid, and that looked like perfect. You know, that's what we wanted. It turned out it wasn't that much of a black box. Black box. And then uh, this one, this one we used, as I say, and still use. Uh, it used. I think it is. I think it is free. Uh, at some point, I think uh, it became. You know, it was. Even commercialized, it was written at NCAR, NCAR and uh, I think some later versions were basically being sold, but uh, um, Adams gave us a version uh, a long time ago. And uh, we, we still use it on occasion if the problem we're dealing with allow us to do that. Okay. So uh, I'll show you, as I say, in the next lecture, uh, a few of the resources where people, you can go for these kinds of packages. Uh, but Mudpack is has been reasonably good to us and has been easy to use. Okay. Uh, that was one. Okay. Um, the last thing, I, the other thing that I wanted to talk about today, and I want to have sort of five minutes left. That I hope to talk to you about sort of uh, other things. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk was I wanted to show you uh, an example of fast direct methods. This was another area that used to be extremely hot. This goes back really to probably the late 70s. Um, and then uh, there was a lot of work done on this in the sort of early 80s. And these methods for problems where they were suitable for really still work extremely well. How many of you know of the fast Fourier transform? FFT. FFT. Okay. 
So I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to talk about the fast Fourier transform here. In the earlier version of the course, I used to do a little bit of that. So the fast Fourier transform was really a marvelous discovery. Basically, uh, you have to sum up series, but the series have very nice structures. So you can actually rearrange the series so that you can do it instead of having to do um, n squared points. That is, if you have n points, you would have to do the summation for all points for every point. You could actually, by taking advantage of the fact that you could group the terms, you actually could do it very fast. It was probably one of the biggest success in, in computational science. The, the cool Tucky algorithm you know, made, the, made the authors famous um, and, as I say, really had a major, major impact. Now, it turned out that the fast Fourier transform has application in solving elliptic equations. Uh, and I'm going to show you how you can do it. Uh, it turns out also that although I'm going to show you a version that relies simply on the uh, fast Fourier transform, you could also start with the elliptic equations, do the same kind of uh, rearrangement of the term as was done in the fast Fourier transform, and come, uh, come up with methods that really were optimized for these equations. The fundamental limitation of the fast Fourier transform is that it works for what is called separable equations, but not for non-separable ones. Okay, so this allows you to do separation of variables. This one doesn't. Okay, so if you remember your course on analytical methods, this one is worked fine. Uh, this one does not, and it turns out that the fast direct methods really work wonderfully for these kinds of equations, but only for very special classes of those. Okay. And that's really the biggest limitations as people have, mon have moved to more complex problems. Also, you typically had to have relatively simple boundary conditions. Now, if you were doing homogeneous flow in a box, and a lot of fundamental fluid mechanics has been done in a cubic domain, uh, then, of course, you, know, you needed to solve the pressure equation. Then it turned out that a separable equation with simple boundary conditions was just fine. OK, so. Uh, this is what I'm not going to tell you, okay? Yes. So for FFT, I was known that the weight of the number should be 2 to the power of n. Yes. That, that, that's why people of my generation think in terms of 32, 64, 128. You know, my student, it takes my students a little while to get used to the fact that all my grids are in power of 2, okay? And the reason they're in power of 2 is A, because of the fast Fourier transform, B, because uh, the, deck, the word length on the Cray-1 supercomputer was 64, okay? So, so now it doesn't matter as much, but at the time it was pretty important to be you know, 64 because if you, for example, on the Cray computers, if you did, um, you know, if you did 59, you were wasting few elements, and if you did you know, 65, then you know, you're really wasting uh, a lot of the word length. So, in any case, so, in that the fast, the discrete fast Fourier transform is a way to calculate this sum in an effective way for all the J points, okay? So, you have to do this sum, so you have F of L and you have N of those, you have to do this for N F of J points, okay? So, you have to do this for every point, and for every point you have to sum over N times. Turns out that's so, it's an N squared operation. And it turns out that, as I say, by realizing that there's a lot of symmetry in these terms here, some of them are zero and some of them are just repeated, you can actually rearrange the sum in such a way that you can really do it in, you know, essentially log n operations. Okay. And you can take both the fast Fourier transform, where you calculate the value from the amplitude, or you can calculate the amplitudes from the values of the distribution. Okay? And as I said, I'm not going to talk about how this is done. Um, it really belongs to a different course. And since this is a little bit of a side issue anyway, these methods have been sort of gone out of fashion. Um, I'm not going to tell you that. But if you do data analysis, you know, this is your bread and butter, right? But sometimes help um, like figure you want to offer some. Sure. Do some FFT on the figures, but actually, the, the figure is not like the grade point is not two to the power of n. <laughs> grade points are not two to the power of n. You have to extend the domain to assume their period. There are lots of issues. Okay, I appreciate that. 
The point being is that you can do this operation very fast. It's called the cooling turkey algorithm, and uh, as I said, it's been around for a long time. Okay. Now, so the question is, can I use this to solve elliptic equations? Here is my equation. Okay. So delta f in this case is actually an approximation to the Laplacian. Sorry about that. So basically, you write the equation out here. And then you take the double Fourier transform, okay? And the important thing is, or actually in this case, you write the double Fourier transform. The important thing is that the, the um, shift in the grid points, okay? Now you can write that down directly, okay? Because the point here, KL plus one, becomes simply a KL. You get simply k out plus one here, and that gives you this chart here. Okay? If you have negative numbers, you get a minus here. Okay? So the important thing is that you know you basically for every every one of those points, it's just like when we did the stability analysis of the von Neumann methods. Okay? So basically when you have the i plus one terms, you still get the amplitude, and then you get terms like these out there. Okay? So a shift is basically multiplying by another number. So now you can do these things analytically. You can find out what the terms are. And then the rest is just the original amplitude. Okay, so the Laplacian of F is the amplitude times these times the original waves times this number here, which again uh, you can calculate. So if you expand now the source term, B, okay, so you know that this is the Laplacian. This is a, you can write the Laplacian here. These are the unknown amplitudes. You can write the source as um, the amplitude here times the waves. And to find this one, you, of course, have to take an inverse Fourier transform. And now the Laplacian is equal to B. And therefore, you can simply solve for the amplitudes given the amplitudes of B. Okay? It's just a division by these numbers. And then, of course, you have to uh, do an inverse Fourier transform to go back. Okay. So, you simply find the amplitude of the source term by a fast Fourier transform. You divide through, as I showed you earlier, that's the effect of the Laplacian. And then you go back by taking the fast Fourier transform. Okay? So, this is an n log uh, n algorithm, okay? And therefore, a much faster than anything else. Insight. Okay. Now, as I say, there was a there was a whole bunch of other versions of this that uh, were developed. Uh, the cyclic reduction are basically based on very similar idea. Uh, but the important thing here, uh, well, was that there, you, you can modify this for other boundary conditions and so on. The important thing here was that this was implemented very early on in a very effective package called Fishpack, uh, for obvious reasons, if you speak French. Portion is fish in French, okay? So, um, it's called Fishpack, and then it was made publicly available, uh, as I say, quite early on. So this is the famous package. Uh, it was originally written by short Chopper and Sweet, and by this uh, version, John Adams had joined them. And it was written at, at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And as I say, it was made publicly available. And when, if you wanted to do turbulent simulations in a cube, you know, you just use this package and um, integrated it into your code. And you were guaranteed that it vectorized, that is, it ran very fast on vector computers like the gray uh, one and two. And uh, suddenly, your elliptic problem essentially went away. So uh, the combination of this being a very, very effective method and the fact that it was suitable, it was optimized for, for the fastest computers around, and it was made available freely to the community, you know, really made this uh, have a, a major impact on how people solve food problems. And this gentleman, John Adams, is the one who later wrote Mudpack uh, in the similar sense. Oh, I believe it is still available. 
can't remember what, in what version. Uh, you know, we, on occasion, if we have a problem that is in a periodic domain with a separable equation, uh, then we still occasionally use this program, even though it's by now 30 years old, uh, because it's still extremely fast and effective. Is it parallelized? Uh, I believe there's a parallel version of this. Um, th th this, was, this was optimized for vectors computers originally, but I think there's a parallel version as well. Okay. So what fact certainly is parallel, but that's based on an entirely different idea. So. Okay. okay, so uh, both examples that I have shown you really are, um, you know, sort of stories of how people develop these very, very effective methods to solve uh, the analytic problem. Uh, the past direct method certainly is a rather specialized method, but uh, where it, when it works, it works extremely well. Uh, it's based on relatively simple ideas. Once you have done the past Fourier transform, there was a whole bunch of sort of expan expansions to this. The multigrid method really is an idea more than a method because there is a lot of ways to implement it. But again, it's based on, you know, it's based on very, very uh, direct physical intuition into how the problem behaves. Okay, and uh, if you remember from our discussions about the, hy the hyperbolic equations, those were also based on, you know, a, a very deep sort of physical insight into the problem. Okay, deep, but you know, not all that complicated once you get it. Okay, and both sort of reinforce a point I've been trying to make that you know. It's hard to do this development of numerical methods if you just look at the mathematics. You know, if you understand the physics, uh, incredible things can happen. Okay? The ABI method, you could argue, was, was really just a math trick. Okay? I'll grant that. Okay? But both, uh, particularly the multigrid methods, as well as many of these hyperbolic methods, we need to derive from a significant sort of physical insight. 